everyone and welcome to Furno's webcast on ambulance safety standards. I'm Paige Moore, marketing manager for Furno, and I'd like to go ahead and tell you how you can interact with us during the webcast. If you have questions, you can share them using the chat feature in the lower right hand part of your screen. We will be answering some questions throughout the webcast. Also, keep in mind that a recording of today's webcast will be available on our website, furnoems.com slash webcasts and also on our YouTube channel. Search for Ferno EMS. I'd like to start by allowing our guests to introduce themselves. Gentlemen. Hi. Uh, my name is Jim West. I'm a program manager at Ferno. I've worked here for 20 years. Uh, currently the chair of the equipment mount committee for AMD um, and also the cabinet uh, committee as well as I was a member of the litter and patient restraint committee. Hi, I'm Chuck Drake. I'm a 36-year veteran of the ambulance and specialty vehicle manufacturing business. I'm a past president of AMD, which is the Ambulance Manufacturers Division of the National Truck and Equipment Association, as well as I'm uh, currently a, uh, a voting member on the NFPA 1917 Committee for Land-Based Ambulances. Thanks, and I'm Steve Rowland. I started out some 25 years ago as a firefighter EMT and got into the ambulance and emergency equipment sales world uh, shortly thereafter. I've been with Ferno about a year. I sit on the NFPA 1917 Ambulance uh, Committee and as well as I co-chair the FEMA, the Fire Apparatus Manufacturers Association Ambulance Technical Subcommittee. Well, just in your introductions, you've introduced us to some terms that we're going to hear during the webcast. AMD, NFPA. Who wants to start by telling us what these mean? Well, and, and it can be confusing because there's so many acronyms out there, but uh, NFPA is the National Fire Protection Association. Uh, the specification that we're discussing today specifically is 1917 uh, land-based ambulances. The AMD uh, is Ambulance Manufacturer Division of the National Truck and Equipment Association, which is an association of ambulance manufacturers and component suppliers. Uh, AMD standards are standards that have been created by that association, uh, which are in essence best practices uh, for, for the manufacturing of ambulances. And then we also have SAE standards. Right. Um, SAE uh, stands for Society of Automotive Engineers. Uh, they publish two recommended practices as it relates to, to ground ambulances. Uh, J2956 and J2917. So if I'm an ambulance operator, public or private, ultimately which standards do I need to follow? That's a, uh, an interesting question. It's, it's one that's <clears throat> in the ambulance uh, world, each state develops their own standards that they certify their ambulances um, to be uh, performing as an ambulance in their state. So it could be the Department of Health or the Department of Transportation, but whatever that agency having jurisdiction is, that is the ultimate authority that puts a license on that ambulance, giving them authority to operate. And if I'm buying <clears throat> equipment, is it my responsibility to ensure that I follow the standards or is it the seller's responsibility or do we work together? How does it work? Well, it's, it in reality is a collaborative responsibility. Uh, however, I, I suppose technically the purchaser is, is responsible for knowing uh, what standards he has to meet. Uh, he may not know um, how to achieve those standards, and that's where the, the dealer and the ambulance builder come into play. Uh, the ambulance dealer and the builder uh, should be uh, educating, uh, informing, uh, explaining to the purchaser the benefit of the standards and how to achieve them. So let's get into the nitty-gritty. What are these standards, or at least some of the key ones that our audience needs to know about? It really starts with where the patient is in the ambulance. The NFPA 1917 spec does require that you designate a primary patient care position. Uh, in essence, uh, as you develop your purchasing document, uh, you need to decide at what location within that patient compartment is, is uh, most frequently occupied or, or uh, for your protocol of service, the uh, most desirable position to be in to treat the patient. Once that primary case, 
primary patient care position has been designated, then other parts of that standard come into play. Um, big one starts with uh, seatbelt monitoring. Certainly, the, uh, the NFPA 1917 standard requires, uh, as do their counterpart fire truck specifications, that each seating position have a seatbelt monitor attached with it, which not only ensures that the seatbelt was buckled when the person occupying the seat sat down, but that the seat belt was not buckled before they sat down, or they were seated and never buckled in the start. Uh, so there's some software that's engineered into that. And really, it acts as a tool to give the driver the information that all of the, his passengers are indeed buckled, and then the agency, again, to enforce a seat belt policy. Uh, it gives them the tools to monitor that and, and say whether or not the, the uh, paramedics and EMTs are actually wearing their seat belts. And you bring up a good point. We had a survey on our, web, uh, on our website, FernoEMS.com, asking folks, what are your major concerns? Obviously, cost came up and the time that it would take to implement came up. But someone else asked about crew training and monitoring. Um, so that definitely plays into it if you have these seatbelt monitors. Absolutely. The, the whole intent of the standard um, in a, a giant 20,000 foot view is to give the operator of the ambulances uh, the equipment and the, the tools to make the most safe uh, environment for both the patient and the provider. And so these, uh, the seatbelt monitoring is one of those many tools that they can use to, to help meet that end. And I guess we do have to address the other big concern, which is cost. How expensive is this going to be? Well, cost, cost is, is driven by several components. Um, obviously, the equipment, uh, be it a, a seat belt monitor or, or other equipment that may be designated within the spec uh, that uh, the um, uh, NFPA committee saw as valuable for, for that squad. So the equipment drives one portion of the cost. The second portion of the cost is, is driven by testing. Uh, the testing that is designated within the spec is more robust than we've normally uh, associated with, with uh, the, the other ambulance specs that are out there as we move towards dynamic testing. The third cost is, frankly, the cost of administering the, the build of the truck, that, that process of pre-build screening, quality assurance documentation, and, and delivery documentation. But I, I think at the end, that cost uh, is, is not the issue here. The issue is about keeping the, the occupants of that ambulance safe. And as long as we're up walking around in the back of the bus, we're not, we're not capable of keeping you safe. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've designated a place to set. We've put a system in to monitor if you're seated. And, and then we've taken that back and we've required that uh, uh, you know, switches and controls and, and radios and all those things that, that you need to do your job are within reach of that seated position. That uh, cabinetry and, and so forth is, is uh, within reach. Work surfaces are within reach. That we're attempting to take you, put you in a, in a, in a seat and belt you and change that configuration to meet your needs from a seated position. You mentioned testing. That was another issue that we had questions about. Um, we actually had a question from Philip. Have there been any crash test engineers involved in the build specs this time to assure that the standards are no more than build specs that have no true data to support? That's a great question. Um, I, I can tell you uh, with, with the work that NIOSH and the AMD and the industry partners are doing, um, we are, uh, there's been a number of crash tests uh, crash test facilities, test houses, do automotive, do military crash testing. Uh, they've been involved in every, every step of the process. Um, at the end of the day, um, as, these, uh, as this research project continues to develop uh, from AMD and NIOSH, um, we'll end up with the most robust uh, and uh, probably safest ambulance that there is in the world. Um, the, uh, the forces that are, that are, that are uh, being applied to the back of this ambulance are being measured in a dynamic environment, not a static, not, not in the back of a napkin. We're taking an ambulance and we're actually crashing it um, in multiple different orientations in multiple different dire directions. Um, 
to get a true measure of what happens in the back of that vehicle. And from that, and from this research, I think you're going to see, you know, um, equipment mounts, you're going to see cabinets, you're going to see seats, you're going to see litter restraints, you're going to see what the back of that ambulance looks like uh, change um, and for the better. Um, and I think it's going to be a really good thing. So that's your insight in the future. Where do you think we go from here? I, I agree with Jim that the uh, certification process is going to become more robust and it's going to require uh, that we are more thoughtful in our uh, design of the truck and in, in our intentions of, of how we operate within that truck that we keep um, equipment stowed until it's needed and, and as it's uh, being uh, applied to the patient, it's, it's, it's stowed in a crash-worthy manner, that type of thing. So I, I agree that, frankly, I, I think all of those forces that are out there are driving us to a better, uh, safer uh, way of providing that, that, that pre-hospital patient care. I think it's important to remember, too, though, that uh, the, K, the, the triple K specification um, is not going away, at least until 2015. So any states that are using that as their, as their ambulance purchasing specification or their uh, standard, um, it'll still be viable through 2015 at least. I, I think when we get to the end of this journey, if, if we as equipment manufacturers and as the manufacturers of ambulances get together and, and successfully take away all the excuses that have been out there for a number of years as to why you can't remain buckled and do your job, why you can't um, store your equipment on top of the cot as it's driving down the road and just, just take those things out of the equation by default will be safer but at least will change the mindset of the, the paramedic and EMT much like the, the mindset of the firefighter and and law enforcement officials have been changed over the years from doing it the way we used to do it to doing the way it should be done right Jim Absolutely. Chuck Steve thank you so much for your time well, today thank you thank you Next, I want to bring in uh, another person to talk about safety. And will you introduce yourself real quick for those who haven't seen you on a previous webcast? Sure, no problem. My name is Tim Wells. I'm the global product manager of our cots and stretchers for Ferno. Uh, that also handles the fastening systems that hold the cots in the back of the vehicles. All right. And as we talk about safety, one product in particular at Ferno, safety was a key part of the product design. And that was with the StatTrack fastener, correct? Correct. Absolutely. The StatTrack's been around since the mid-90s. Uh, we recently redesigned it to meet the new SAE 2917 and 2956 uh, standards for testing. And so what we did is we changed it a little bit, but it's a very nice design in helping the cot guide the cot into the back of the vehicle, as well as making it easier to clean around the, the cot. All right. And we have a new video, actually, of the StatTrack that we're going to share with our audience now. As you can see in the video, there's a PUD system on the bottom of the stat track that fits into the floor plates. As they flip the stat track over, they push it forward into like a keyhole style floor plate. There's a lever on the door end of the stat track. You can flip down. It locks into position. There are posts on each end, the operator end shown here, and also the load end of the cot. As they go into the vehicle, you can see the post going into the stat track funnel. There's a latch there that catches the crossbar. They lift up the undercarriage, push the cot in, get the second post and the operator in, slide it sideways, and it locks into the fastener. To remove it, it's a handle on the side of the stat track. They pull the handle towards them, release the cot to the right, and pull it out of the vehicle. The lever on the stat track prevents it from coming all the way out. They release it from the lever, and the stat track comes out of the vehicle. Well, thank you very much for sharing the video. That was great, and it really shows how in-action StatTrack helps, not just with the loading, but with patient security while they're in, uh, in the ambulance itself. Absolutely. You're welcome. Well, thank you very much for attending our webcast today. A recording of this session will be available on our website, so you can go to ferno.com slash webcast later on, and you can see it. And it will be also posted on our YouTube page, so just search for Ferno EMS on YouTube. If you would like more information on these topics, or if you have additional questions, you can email us. The address is fernoems at ferno.com, or you can call us at 877-733-0911. Thanks for joining us today, and have a great day.